All right, welcome back to News Hour. It's exactly 22 o'clock on the dot, and this is the last session for the night today on News Hour. And uh, tonight we want to talk about uh, science, eliminating politics completely out of the discussion on GMOs and what it is, and if we have a policy. I mean, at the end of the show, we'll play for you a soundbite of uh, the current president, then agriculture president, William Ruto, saying that unless there is a framework, unless there's a both national, local and international framework to have GMOs in the country, we are not ready as a country. We'll be playing that, but I'll ask Karen if she can play it at the beginning of the show. But before then, let's look at the bold newspaper, the standard, because this is what you expect for tomorrow immediately at the stroke of the night. I have my advanced copy. So the headline we are splashing tonight, Inside Ruto's Team Radical CBC Option, it's out already. The task force went around to collect ideas. Standard is breaking down that for you tonight. So grab a copy if you want to know. If you're a parent already, secondary schools, you're told, next year when the calendar resets in January of 2023, you're going to be paying more. If you're paying 35,000 uh, shillings per term, you're going to be paying more. If you're paying 53, you're going to be paying more. So look at, uh, you need to grab a copy to know inside Ruto's team's radical CBC options. And also uh, front page, Mudabadi Stamps Authority, uh, as senior most western kenya leader not even senior in age but even senior in position prime cabinet secretary the standard telling you about that he met a group of western kenya leaders but right at the top is our subject of discussion that is maize and ruto allies split on plan to impeach moses Kuria. why we'll find out tonight because we're discussing it so grab a copy apart from that there's a story about the ibc the renegade commissioners or the serena four and why Cherera is asking the court to give a little time to prevail on uh, parliament to give a little time to respond to the four petitions that seeks to remove them that also the front page of the standard please grab a copy because only the bold speak the truth thank you so much for joining us tonight daktari uh joel oche Thank you so much for joining us. It's a good discussion. I know he to me let us a maki komaji. So it's a good discussion. Joel Cheng is a Secretary General, Kenya University Biotechnology Consortium. Asante Sana for coming. And on the other side on Zoom, we are joined by Anne Miner, the National Coordinator of Biodiversity and that's uh, Biodiversity Kenya. She also joins us to speak about this singular subject of GMO. Thank you so much, Anne, for joining us tonight. And of course, I'll start from, uh, from, from Joy. I'd like to know from the outset as the debate progresses, do you support the use, the consumption of products that have been developed as a, as a result of modifications or not? Let me put it as simple as such. Yes, I do. Oh, you do support? And, and the reason why I do is that I make them. Oh, because you make them. I'm coming back to you. Let me see where Anne stands. So, Anne, where do you stand? Do you support the use, the consumption of modified products and the end results? Do you, do you support the use? No, we do not. I do not personally, and I, my organization, mm -hmm. the Biodiversity and Biosafety Association of Kenya, has yes. been clear in its stand. We have serious concerns about uh, genetically engineered crops, and we do not support them. You do not support. I'm coming to you, Anne. You do not. She, she's the coordinator for Biba Kenya. So uh, tell me why, before you tell me why you make this debate has divided the stakeholders in this country. I mean, it's been there for a while. It's not the first time we're hearing about GMOs. Probably the first time I heard about it is in the uh, 2008, 2000, uh, probably 2009. And then the debate is back to the fore right now after that announcement from Moses Kuria. From where you sit, why are Kenyans so concerned and do they have a point? Yes, uh, Kenyans are concerned for various reasons. And some of those reasons are valid, others are perfect. Now, the valid issues are that every person, including you and me, are concerned about their safety. And if we are mixing issues in their ears to the level where they do not know what to listen to and which one is correct version, then they have a reason to be concerned. Because they have heard from especially the political leaders where some say that uh, there is no problem consuming uh, genetically modified foods, while others are telling them this is poison brought here to kill us. And so Kenyans are confused, and, okay. and, and they have a very reason to be concerned. Mm -hmm. I would be concerned if I were be not. Because they don't understand? Sometimes because they don't understand, mm -hmm. other times because they have a position that is fixed, that they have decided to take. Okay. Yes. So biodiversity and biosafety must be 
having a valid reason why they are concerned about this and tell me is it the misinformation or lack of information or just different positions that we are taking um and because of that we are where we are today as a country first of all no, th th that is a question to Anna. i'm coming to you thank you the information is out there it's uh not with everyone especially wanjiko does not have access to the proper information our major concerns about the genetically engineered crops are socioeconomic and health concerns uh when you look at work done by scientists independent scientists they have questioned the safety of genetically engineered crops and here to clarify that as an organization our people working on this issue we are not against biotechnology in general biotechnology has been in existence for hundreds of years when you bake bread you're using biotechnology but the controversial bit is the genetically engineered crops where across the species barrier uh, scientists uh, do this in the laboratory and uh, cross different species uh, and develop this uh, genetically engineered crops if you look for example at the issue of uh, gmo or bt cotton uh when i talk about socioeconomic concerns uh when it was introduced in burkina faso in 2009 2010 uh the there were major challenges that were experienced by the farmers because uh, the seed eventually was 40 times the cost of the um convention of varieties which made the cotton very expensive to produce not easily accessible for farmers at that cost number two it was of poorer quality notice this is cotton that is going to be we have introduced in kenya uh maybe it is now at season one and this is one of the major issues that we've raised but looking at the health concerns uh, mm -hmm. the safety uh protocols not proper safety protocols have been developed uh, for genetically engineered crops. And I'll give an example of a scientist called Aspat Pushtai, who was trying to develop a safety protocols for GM potatoes uh, uh, in the UK, uh, when he found and questioned some of the uh, findings he was getting, development of uh, tumors and all those, his research team was quickly disbanded and uh, he even lost his teaching uh, opportunity and he's not the only scientist and that's why we are asking for precaution by our government okay. because if there's a question on these issues we need to take precaution we need to take precaution we need to take precaution i mean she has explained where the fear is and the example she has given is uh, cotton how can you attempt to improve a variety and then it end up ends up being a poor variety i don't know from um, your point of view does anna have a point to justify the concerns that she has and kenyans have well every person has um justification for what they believe either what they believe or what they are designed to believe but uh, to answer that uh, directly on the issue of the quality if a product assume that health is no issue yeah Assume the issue is quality. Yeah. You don't even need to do anything. People will just stop using it. If a crop is of lower quality, who would plant it? And higher price. Yeah. Nobody would yeah, nobody yeah. adopt it. Mm -hmm. So then there's no issue. So for it to <laughs> prosper and be an issue to be talked about, it must be of superior quality. I mean you would not keep a cow that is giving you no milk or maybe a liter uh, of milk. Less milk than normal cows. Yeah. We would not even discuss it. You'd just stop using it. Mm -hmm. And you so don't even buy it when so you go to the market. You didn't even buy it in the first place. Mm -hmm. If it's costing two million to buy, and it's giving you uh, <laughs> less than one half liter of milk, why would we even discuss it? It wouldn't exist because nobody would adopt it. For us to be discussing this matter and assuming that safety is not an issue to them, then it must be a superior quality. And that superior quality is the issue. That one, the inputs are much lower, mm -hmm. and so the shelf uh, price is retailing at a lower cost and is killing business for some people also and particularly she's talking about bt cotton i'm sure and when you embed a bt gene within the cotton uh, genome what that means is that it protects the cotton from crop pest the cotton ball worm particularly so they can survive so then mm -hmm. now there's no pest damage mm -hmm. so the cotton becomes of superior quality and you harvest more now this is a concern to most people especially those who sell pesticides 
It's a multi-billion industry. Because you're killing their business. You're killing their business. And they will fight you back by whatever means. They will find institutions that mutate in the naming. Today they're called this. Tomorrow they've conglomerated. The three of them, they're called something else. They keep mutating. If you look at how long an institution survives, it tells you whether they are there for a proper mission or something else. And it tells you what interest they serve. I mean, we are researchers. Our institutions are intact and it will be there for the next century because we serve public interest. But if I form some small institution that will be there only as long as there's a debate, and when there's no debate, it's dead. I mean, common sense tells us that these are things set up for that purpose. But let's not discuss institutions. Let's discuss the real issue. The here. real issues here. No. Uh, b b okay, go ahead. The real issue here is that, first, I want us to separate politics from science. The issue of importation, let's put aside. It's not my role. Yeah. We, I would don't even want to comment on this. Let's discuss whether BT maize, that's the one meant for Kenya, not GMO. Mm -hmm. We have several formulations for what people call GMO. There is a maize that has been modified to tolerate the spray of herbicide. It's called Roundup Tolerant Maize. Roundup is available in AgroVex in Kenya without even the, uh, I mean, without genetically engineered maize at all. People are using it to, to spray on their farms to kill weeds before they plant. Mm -hmm. But ideally, Roundup was made for, for GM maize that is called Roundup Tolerant Maize. You know, in, in the US and uh, other such countries, they have thousands of hectares of farmland, mm -hmm. maize fields. They even use airplanes to, play, to spray because you can't weed manually, thousands of hectares. In Kenya, we have smallholder farmers mm -hmm. that barely have an acre. So we don't need that kind of maize at all here for cultivation. What we have here is that our biggest problem is stem borer and foliage borer mm -hmm. that ravage our farms when you plant maize, when you grow, not just plant. Now what we do is that we have modified that maize to have inborn protection against the borer. Tell, t tell me that modification. What yes. goes into that modification? What yes. is it that you modify? I'm looking at a, yes. a, a maize. Uh -huh. Whatever, is it a seedling? What is it? Whatever it is. Kennel. Just one, one of it. It's called a kennel. Yes. But so you can call it seed for a seed, yes. For general so purpose, what honey. do you modify in that now, seed? We don't modify a seed. Yeah. What do you do? We modify a cell. What is a cell? A cell is much smaller than a seed. A cell okay, is the your smallest device, uh, unit. Smallest unit of living. Uh, yes. Systems. So you open that seed. Yes. A single one. You crush down the seed. You crush it down, yes? Yes. Uh -huh. Then you take a single cell. Okay. One, just a single cell. Mm -hmm. Once you take a single cell, then that cell is not even the whole of it is going to be used. No. You go down to the genome. Of that cell. Which has thou millions of uh, DNA, a million of DNA uh, copies. And you go down to the smallest part, which is just a protein. Cry protein. That is the one to be modified. Not a, not a whole seed. And I think I've been seeing people using needles or a donga, I mean, so that there is an impression mm -hmm. that uh, a, syringe, yeah. a syringe has been used to modify a seed, an actual seed. No, we're not using seeds at all. You break it down completely. You break it down to cells mm -hmm. and break the cell down to much smaller particles than a cell. Mm -hmm. That part of the genome only is the one modified. And what we do is this. We take a gene from a harmless soil bacterium that is available in our foods, that is available in our food systems, and we take it daily without any harm. It's called Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT. I'm sure many people think BT means biotechnology. No. It means Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacterium of known safety for several decades that we use in our salads, that we use in our food systems, mm -hmm. and that, in fact, has been used as a spray, as a pesticide but oral spray. Now, that is the same bacterium that we have taken. We have taken out a single gene from that bacterium. So we didn't take the bacterium, we didn't take the whole cell of the bacterium. Just a single gene a from single it, gene. out of thousands. Out of thousands and millions of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that gene, what it does is that it releases a certain chemical, or I would call it the protein, that is expressed, that kills the stem borer. Now, the reason why it kills the stem borer, not you or me, is that the stem borer has a certain receptor that this thing can attach to. 
We don't have it. Our example is malaria queen. You take malaria queen, I do, and they all do. The well, I'm allergic is, to it, but it's okay yes, to use an yes. example. Yes. The issue is this. Mm -hmm. Malaria queen is made so specific that it goes down and targets plasmodium falciparum mm -hmm. that causes malaria. It's a plasmodium. It doesn't kill any bacterium in your tummy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't kill any other microorganisms. And you know there are many here. Yeah. And even yourself. It doesn't kill you. It doesn't kill any microorganism within your body, which are very many. Mm -hmm. And if you remove them, you'll die. They're required there. It kills only the plasmodium. That is the same specificity that, you that we are using okay. to, in, to what I would call immunize mm -hmm. this maze. Okay. Yes. Okay. Quite successful tonight in confusing me so much <laughs> uh, scientific terms, but we are here for science. I mean, and you have to respond to what he has said uh, because there's so much that perhaps we don't understand. You, where you work, biosafety and uh, I mean, you have looked into what he's telling us. Is there something that is intentionally omitting so that we don't understand what they actually do? Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, uh, and you've had that long explanation by Dr. G o o o Chien. Yes. Um, the issue about Bacillus thuringiensis, yes, it's a natural bacteria in the ground. But the BT that is uh, changed in the laboratory to be crossed to the maize is a synthetic one. And it doesn't easily disintegrate like the natural one found in the environment. That causes two problems. In the in France, they found the BT is still quite, uh, uh, after 30 years, it's still being found in the water tables because it doesn't easily disintegrate. Number two, one issue about uh, the BT uh, maize or cotton variety is. For the maize, uh, Dr. has told us that it is uh, genetically modified to deal with the challenge of the Stop maize stem borer. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at uh, the countries that uh, have uh, been growing uh, GMOs for many years, let's, start, let's say the U.S., which has started off in 1996, or South Africa 1998, these are areas where the maize is grown in monocultures. And there's one rule that uh, uh, in growing the GMOs, you have to leave a refugia or uh, what you call a buffer zone around your farm, like uh, five meters around your farm to avoid cross-pollination. Now, you can imagine farmers in these countries who have monocultures and huge farms who are not able to maintain those barriers. What happened is that with cross-pollination, there was emergence of super pests and super weeds. And the link, now you could see what most of the scientists say that with GMOs, uh, you don't have to spray so much. Uh, but now because of the super pests and super weeds, uh, there's been a lot of more sprays and this has a direct link because some of these pesticides, herbicides, and uh, uh, all these chemicals used, they have a negative effect uh, on, on, the, on the environment, on, on, our, on our health. The typical uh, farmer in Kenya, Wanjiko, has an acre, two acres, half an acre. They cannot afford to leave this buffer zone around their farms to avoid the cross pollination. So you have a, that challenge because if you look at, for example, in uh, Canada, there was a farmer called Percy Smizer. He passed on. He was growing conventional uh, canola for oil, and his neighbors were growing the genetically engineered canola. And he was a huge farmer, but still there was cross pollination or what you call drift. And the farmer was sued by the company that owned the patent to that uh, uh, genetic engineered uh, technology. So one question you need to ask ourselves here in Kenya, is it realistic to grow these GMOs uh, with the, the smallholder farmers? Our farmers thrive in diversity. And so you find that uh, your, your typical farmer is growing some maize, some beans, some cassava, some sweet potatoes, some vegetables. And because of the climate challenges that you are facing, this farmer is able to cope and become more resilient with the challenges that we face. But now asking farmers, and most of the GMOs require that you grow them in monocultures. And BT is one of the insect, uh, one of the insect resistant varieties. You also have the uh, herbicide tolerant varieties where you need to grow them as a monoculture so that when you, when you spray, you can be able to manage the weeds and the, and the, and the pests that may attack the crops. And this are one of the issues where, where we have raised 
disease. The linkage between uh, genetically engineered crops and toxic pesticides and herbicides. And these have been proven, a lot of these uh, herbicides and pesticides have been proven to bring a lot of health challenges. And that is an issue that we have always raised about genetically engineered crops. Number two, let me say this. Uh, Dr. Ri has said that uh, uh, they work in the laboratory and uh, they work with very small, uh, you cannot see with the naked eye the genes that they are changing. But when you look at, uh, for example, a child who is affected or a person affected by Down syndrome, it's only one gene that was one chromosome that was changed, that changed that caused that challenge. So we are asking ourselves, or we are even questioning, and some scientists, especially the independent scientists, have said that scientists have not fully understood the interplay. And when you sit in the laboratory and are trying to uh, change this, there, there are many changes that occur out there. Yes, it's true. There are mutations that happen naturally every day. But this one in the laboratory is a very dangerous way for us to go. Okay, tell me, before I come to uh, Dr. here, tell me something. You mentioned because of that and cross-pollination, there was a rise of super weeds and super pests. Explain to me this. Is it as a result of um, um, the, the cross-pollination or is it as a result of complications? Because now one side of a plantation is using the natural one let me call it and this other one is using the modified ones and then there's cross pollination so the super weeds become resistant or the super pests what exactly did you mean with that so look at uh, for example uh, the maize uh, when uh, when it is genetically engineered with bt is to deal with the issue of the stem borer and the bt produces a toxin that kills the stem borer but now when you have this cross pollination with the other varieties, be they conventional or organic, there is that drift also that comes in with some of these pests and uh, weeds. And now, because you have only uh, genetically engineered it, engineer the crop to deal with the issue of the maize stem borer the others now become a challenge so what you find farmers like in south africa what they were doing with the emergence of for example the fola home and other pests and, uh, and weeds they were spraying actually spraying more to deal with the challenges of these uh, pests and diseases and uh and weeds and that's a major concern that has been raised with the particular variety that wants to be introduced in kenya Dr. Dr. you sat very patiently. I see you fidgeting. At some point, I thought you wanted to say, Ken, let me explain this. What, is, what, what did you get from what she's trying to explain? Because she's just mm. trying to uh, deconstruct everything you said. Yeah. You know, universities uh, train us to be patient and to be reasonable in public. So I wouldn't interrupt, oh, in public. I wouldn't interrupt anybody <laughs> talking. Okay. Anyway, now, there are two issues that we need to, uh, to distinguish here. And this is where the confusion begins. And Anne Maina is a friend, and I know she knows the truth. First, BT maize is not sprayed at all by anything, with anything. That is the essence. We are trying to reduce the issue of spraying so that we make it not necessary to use any chemical to spray and kill the pest. Instead, we are putting an inborn protection onto the maize. Kill it naturally. To kill it naturally. Yeah. And there are two issues here. She stands for biodiversity. Biodiversity means as many organisms as possible. Now, when you spray, you are likely to kill everything. Even if you don't kill, you affect them in some way. Even those that were not about that, you're amazed. Now, we are putting an inborn protection to kill only the one that anaikochakosa, only the one that eats your maize. Mm -hmm. Now, the next issue, Roundup is not used on BT maize. Roundup is for weeding and it is done on Roundup tolerant maize. Unfortunately though, Kenyans are using Roundup without having a Roundup tolerant maize, without GM maize. Why are they using Roundup? They're using it to spray on the farm. To because of the before. weed? No, before planting. Or before planting. They, okay. they want to kill the weeds before planting, which is actually uh, malpractice. This is the one you're explaining because of yes. large chambers in the US. Yes. They need yes. it because they can't weed physically yes. or manually. What, what they did is that they, they modified the maize to be Roundup tolerant. Roundup uh, tolerant to that to chemical? That Roundup, yes. yes. Okay. So you come spray the whole farm mm -hmm. with your maize intact. Mm -hmm. The maize remains Are planting. we growing that maize here or we are no, no, no. We are using the same maize but using Roundup here? No, yeah. we, are not, we don't have that maize here. But we are using Roundup here? But we are using Roundup. How do we access it here? 
How do we it's get a, it to our market? It's freely in the agrovet. Why do agrovets import something we don't need? Tell me why. I you tell me why. Because there must be a reason why it comes to the market and it's attractive. Actually, I was born when it was here. It's not something new. It's free. You just walk to the counter and buy it. Nobody will ask you where you're going with it. Okay, now, proceed. The next issue is, mm -hmm. first of all, now we understood there is no spraying for BT maize. And I think it would be fair to talk about what we have here. What we have developed locally through uh, what we call PPP, that is Public-Private Partnership which is BT maize. We don't have Roundup tolerant maize here. We don't intend to have it. It's a technology that's not required here because we have smallholders. Now, she's talking about uh, buffer zones, that farmers would have difficulty in getting buffer zones. Remember one thing. We have hybrid maize. We have local land races. We have BT maize now. Farmers will choose what is appropriate for their system. And the National Biosafety Authority, which is the regulator, for uh, genetically modified organisms will assess your farm. So, BT maize is not something that anybody will want to walk in, buy, go and plant anywhere. No, it's regulated. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be a problem to the neighbor. There are regulations. We have the act, that is Biosafety Act 209. Then we have four regulations. We have the handling regulation. We have the labeling regulation for your information that even when you are selling it in the supermarket shelf, you must label it, it must probably. be labeled this is GMO. Anybody who wants organic will go and buy organic. Whoever wants GMO will go and buy GMO. And of course, many people will want GMO because it sells cheaper. Given that the inputs have been eliminated, so it will, it will retail at a lower cost. And that's the worry people have. That is coming here, it will retail at a lower cost. If I was making billions out of uh, hunger and poverty, I will lose out of that. So you must uh, examine people's fear. And especially when that fear becomes sudden, and when that fear follows certain political systems, which are not our business here. So, Annos and Kenyans now should be informed that BT maize is not to be sprayed with anything. It has inborn protection against the pest. And that BT is safe for use, and that GMO is labeled food, and the process of developing it follows a Biosafety Act and regulations and close supervision by the national regulator from the laboratory all the way to the shelf. And before you now come out, the process is, you make it in the lab, you test it on cells, you test it on model organisms, you test it on uh, nutritional components, agronomy components, you test it in what you call confined field trials mm -hmm. to see whether truly it protects against the pest. You plant them side by side in confinement. Mm -hmm. They come and inspect throughout mm -hmm. until it's maturity. Then you do what we call national performance trial. Now that you have proved that it protects it against the pest, how does it do in other parts of the country? Are you making something for only one place? So they come and inspect through national performance trial, which is conducted by KEFIS, not by the man who made it. You know, regulatory systems must have integrity. Once you do something and you claim, the regulators now want to assess it and see whether it is true. Now, NBA does safety, test, safety tests on the same thing. And this is an example of what they do. They send out a call to the public that we have received an application for an environmental release of a particular item. We have hired experts to assess it, and ourselves also want to assess it. But before we go ahead, can the public bring their comments on whether they agree that BT maize should be released into the environment or not? Or not? Before they even say scientifically it's OK, they look at socioeconomic aspects. Is it acceptable to the people? Is it acceptable to the environment? That's where NEMA comes in there. And does it kill untargeted organisms? What does it do? What's the protein that was been put in there? They do all that. Before they read. Consultation is very wide in this matter. Well, the widest I can ever see on anywhere on earth. But on days, mm -hmm. how many Kenyans have knowledge and even the time mm -hmm. to come and present their views on such? They don't require you to come to Nairobi. Mm -hmm. What happens is that they send out a call through the newspaper through this the newspapers, is a publication yes. yes through the newspapers through the websites through national leaders and this particular one members of parliament consulted their constituents and brought letters of them the letters are at nba that mps carried physically into nba it is something that requires very wide consultation
I, 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 I believe a lot of things you say tonight, but I don't believe anything regarding Kenyans' participation in this. I am mm. a Kenyan and I, I, I don't believe this. Mm. But let me ask you this yes. before I go back to one. Mm. Why is it suddenly maize has become so testless and we have very ma big maize cobs? If maize has become testless and we don't have it yet in the market, then it means something else. It means that due to climate change, due to our agronomic practices and due to the soil types, we are losing taste in terms of the biochemical component of maize, not anything related to GMO. Really? We how don't have it here. How we, we don't have it, but you say BT is modified. It's been here for a while. I've seen people... No, 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 no. Mm. I think we are confusing issues here. It is now that KFIS is going to give it a variety name mm -hmm. before it goes to farmers. So it hasn't. So no, right now we've not. never planted no, any no, no, kind no. The only test planting that was done mm -hmm. was supervised planting for the purpose of conducting trials. Only? Yes. So the, the maize that we were talking about that you were saying does not require spraying yes. anywhere. Uh -huh. It's not public. No, it's, it's private. not with any farmer. So no farmer has that maize? Not yet. So Kenya, we've not grown that? No, no, no. When you said when you go to the counter, you can find and it should be strictly labeled because there's a law for that. Uh -huh. It's labeled GMO and people go for it because it's cheap. Yes. Who are these people who go for it if it does not exist? I'm saying mm. that when it will come. Oh, when? And, and so also, we don't have this. And also, yes. we have been importing GMO for some time. There's, in 2011, we had a very large consignment mm -hmm. until there was a ban in 2012. We were receiving it. All okay, around. okay. Yeah. Explain this because I want to go to one. Explain to me again. Mm -hmm. um, why do we have huge maize cobs, a maize stock breeding three, four? Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that give this concern. Now, I, I, I drive down to Migori mm -hmm. and by the road when I like maize, so you buy it, mm -hmm. even right here in Nairobi, for you to take maize and you want just the one Mitomo Kandaya Barabara, yes. you have to apply lemon and chili to make it taste. Mm -hmm. Kitambo, when you use even Ugali, when I grew up, mm -hmm. you could eat Ugali alone because Ugali had a taste. Mm -hmm. Now there's no taste in Ugali. So these are the concerns. I'm taking you down to the people. Mm -hmm. These are the concerns. Probably we're eating what we shouldn't eat. Now, mm. that loss of taste is not uh, uh, Because it's been it's uh, not perfect. Uh -huh. It is true that many things have lost their taste. And you should know this. We have done intensive selection on our varieties in our cropping systems. Selection towards particular traits. If you over-select, not without, without GMO, mm -hmm. if you over-select for a particular trait, for example, your, your priority is uh, the yield. You might be losing on test. But you have a high Maybe your yet. priority is drought, tolerance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You might be losing on test. Mm -hmm. So this is normal selection that farmers do intensively for a specific thing. How, how do they... And how, that compromises other things. How, how do they select this? Because from, mm. you come here, mm -hmm. you go into your farm, you want a seed for the next season, yeah. you pick the largest cobs, don't you? And you store them for yes, planting. Yeah. you'd pick the largest cobs. Would you pick the smaller cobs? Obviously you pick the not. best. Obviously not. Mm -hmm you would pick the larger ones. But you're not taking care of the fact that the larger ones may not be the most nutritionally competent. So through that selection over okay, generations, okay, okay. you have lost the taste. So we, we, yeah, because yeah. we might be doing it subconsciously also. Yes, it's subconscious actually. Okay, and let me bring you in. I know you've been listening in. Before I, I, I introduce the next aspect of my question, I want you to weigh in on everything you said, including the fact that you, you might be... Uh, mixing issues also in terms of uh, what we have, what we don't have, and how it's supposed to be done. Thank you, Ken. I didn't get fully your question, but let me begin by the issue you raised about taster. Huh? When we consume food, and even from a long time ago, there are many aspects that we look at. Food is about culture. Seed is about culture. Some of the communities, like among the Meru community, when a girl is getting married, she's given seed to go and establish her new uh, farm or start growing her own crops. And uh, when I talked about genetically engineered, and also uh, Dr. Tari has alluded to the fact, because of too much uh, crossing and uh, selection, we have lost taste. Uh, but apart from losing taste, we have lost also nutritional value. Because uh, when you do too much of that, you lose the, the value. Uh, you and I, uh, of yourself, you have told us the ugali these days is not as tasteful because we are losing the local varieties. When you introduce the local, when you introduce GMOs and they cross with the local varieties, you lose your 
a rich genetic pool and biodiversity. And that's a big challenge because going back would be very difficult uh, to go back and get our uh, local varieties or the farmer managed seeds that are very important in ensuring diversity and resilience. But also to go back to an issue that uh, you raised on public participation. If you look at our researcher or our regulatory agency, the National Biosafety Authority, it has 50 staff only in the whole of Kenya. This is a regulator who will be checking on who's bringing GMOs, labeling GMOs and all that. There is no capacity. The government needs to put money into supporting our local institutions, even not only to do uh, uh, regulation, but even the likes of uh, Dr. there. When they are doing their research in the university, they need to have government funding so that they can do independent research. Right now, you see a lot of research that's funded in some of these higher education institutions, and our research agency is funding that's coming from the uh, corporate or corporate control. So you ask yourself often, uh, well, even when you go for public participation, and I have participated in many in Kenya, most of the time they happen in Nairobi. Where is the voice of the farmer? Where is the voice of the consumer? I can go to that such as a public participation forum because I'm aware of the issues. So you ask yourself the question, is it public participation that is just in Nairobi or are we talking of issues of corporate capture? Look at the at the recent uh, declaration by our trade minister, bringing in 10 million bags of GMO duty-free into the country. In previous years, when we've had food shortages or build on our strategic grain reserves, uh, we always used to, uh, to look for non-GMO maize to come into our country. And so why are we running to bring in this maize, our farmers in the Rift Valley, uh, in various parts of the country, are now harvesting. Can't we buy that maize and fill in the gap later? But immediately that announcement is made, before even the Gazette notice is signed, the ships are docking in the port of Mombasa. Is it about the trade or is it about agriculture? Who should be dealing with this? And uh, uh, one, one thing I wanted to say also, is that uh, Daktari should tell us there are different kinds of GMOs. There is the insect resistant, like what we are talking about, BT maize, BT cotton. There is herbicide tolerant. True, it's not yet in Kenya, but that's the one that uh, you have to spray lots of Roundup to manage it. You can have drought drought tolerance. You can have virus uh, virus resistant, and you can also have stacked genes. And so there are different ways to, they are doing their research. If you look at GMO cassava, and Kenya is one of the first countries in the whole world that has approved GMO cassava. It's about virus resistance, and one of our policy briefs we've raised issues about issues of dealing with the cassava mosaic and cassava uh, brown streak disease. This can be controlled by proper phytosanitary standards and control of how the 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 stop the the, the the seed is moving or the or the cassava cuttings instead of running to introduce a technology that remains controversial and has not been proven to be safe. Very interesting, very interesting. You know the other aspect that I would have wanted to ask is about um, 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 living food like uh, chicken and all that but i will not ask so um about the issue of the ship it's not here we don't even know the maze that is here we don't even know if uh, it's what uh, the cs was referring to or it's just coincidental so that that one we wait to see so how do we from where you sit as a researcher how do we convince kenyans that um the apro regarding this importation is not called for how do we get it to them that it's okay because even tonight the fact that two individuals who are very knowledgeable differ on this how do the people on the ground my mom my mother watching me go how do you convince my mother that there is nothing wrong with this because even the, that difference of opinion between two experts yes. so to say yeah now first we need to understand what these experts stand for there's one who is developing a product there's another one who has uh, a fixed opinion by virtue of the institution they work for. I mean, there's no way you can be working for Emirates and then you begin saying that Kenya Airways has the best flights. We don't expect that. So now, uh, there's an issue that she has touched on which I think is good to address. It's just kind. Uh, about the fact that there was an announcement and then a ship has docked. Just because I have information. 
the issue is this. Uh, many people are saying that uh, President William Ruto has lifted the ban on GM, which was in place since 2012. And I want to tell you that's not true. By paper, not by hearsay or rumors. President Uhuru Kenyatta allowed the local cultivation of BT cotton in 2019, and Anne is aware of that. And cotton is used 60% as food and feed, and only 40% as lint for making clothes. Two, in July this year, 2022, the CS Treasury gazetted that people are now allowed to bring in GM maize or any other cereal to be used in animal feed industry and as a certain percentage, but duty free. I, I hope you are supposed to be aware of this. So all these things have happened before and the gazettement was in July that allows a ship to dock. I'm not the owner of the ship. I don't belong to any political party. I'm just talking science. And I'm aware of the Gazette notice. I can send it to you if you need it. It's freely available. It's a government document that gazetted allowing people to bring in GM maize to be used in the animal feed industry in July this year. This year, especially. For uh, animal feed. You, uh, not really yeah. brutal. Animal feed. Yes. Animal feed. To yes. be used in animal feed industry. Yeah. Yes. We have not seen people eating it at the port. So I want to assume. The as they were allowed, mm -hmm. maybe, I'm using that maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that's the ship we're talking about. I don't know. Maybe. I don't want to go into it. So tell me, the yes. first act of uh, William Ruto when he became president mm -hmm. with the old cabinet mm -hmm. was to um, approve mm -hmm. this issue of GMO. Yes. What do you mean he did not approve it? Now, what I'm saying is this. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, <laughs> can, there was no ban on GMO. So you cannot approve was, what was never banned? Yes, there was no ban because it wasn't done as required by law. There was, there was a cabinet declaration, not a ban, a cabinet declaration putting on hold further importation of GM maize, further importation only, not local cultivation, not, not consumption. Mm -hmm. A temporary hold on Im any further importation of uh, GMO mm -hmm. as we await the result of a task force report. The task force was headed by Kihumbi Dairu, professor, who is my colleague at the University of Nairobi. And the task force conducted public participation. They examined publications. They examined any other evidence available. And they have made their report. Now, President Uhuru Kenyatta relied on that report in allowing for local cultivation of beet cotton and also for allowing the importation of, of GM maize to be used in the feed industry in July. Now, what Ruto did is this. We don't want a system where you, it's unpredictable. If I apply to import GMAs today, what's my fate? You know, business, business is about reliability. So what Ruto did is that he wanted an open governance system. So he made a declaration that we now seize the ban that was in place. So that if you want to apply, you know your fate. You just said put on hold, now you're using the word ban. I'm confused, Dr. Tani. You know now, mm -hmm. because we are all using the word ban even though there's but no put, ban put, put, put on hold mm -hmm. is is put on hold is stopped until further notice put on hold means mm -hmm. stop until further notice you just put on the hold ba you, the word ban is legal yes while the one stop mm -hmm. is anything else it's english yes english <laughs> i want to play uh karen if you have the sound bite from uh, the former agriculture um minister as you look for it as you look for it i'd like your reaction on on this ban and lifting the ban and of course putting on hold yes um uh the ban was instituted in 2012 uh through a cabinet decision where there was a ban of importation of gmo foods that did not stop researchers from doing research and i've always challenged my friend like dr ching and professor odura and asked them it's 10 years since the ban uh, was instituted and finally lifted why haven't we had local uh, research done in Kenya for them to prove to us that these GMOs are safe. Because when you look at genetically engineered crops from the US, they are mostly grown, uh, the maize is grown for animal feed. But if it is brought here to Kenya, like these 10 million uh, bags, uh, this is maize that uh, will be eating almost on, on a daily basis. Kenyans consume maize, be it in Ugali, Gideri, on a daily basis. 
what will be the impact on our lives, on our health? And that is a question that we thought the scientists had 10 years to do their research and share with us their findings. Unfortunately, he who's controlling the research is playing the tune. He who, pay, who pays the piper plays the tune. And we are seeing our researchers are uh, depending on research that has been done out there coming here to tell us we are doing confined field trials, national performance trials, when they when they take their dossiers to the National Bio Safety Authority, a lot of information is hidden under the, the confidential business information. Our The capacity of a National Bio Safety Authority cannot be able to do independent risk assessments to prove what is put in those dossiers. And this is a big issue that we have raised concerns about it. And look at corporate control. Once uh, these GMO seeds uh, are introduced and the foods are introduced, who will hold the patent? Who will control that food? He will control your seed, will control food, and will control even the lives of Kenyans. For, for them, it's about profit. For them, it's about uh, entering the market and ensuring that they control uh, production and uh, profits for them. Oh, okay. So I, I want to ask you this from uh, biodiversity and biosafety. Um, one of the things uh, Dr. Cheng has said, and I, I wish you respond to this. The only reason that perhaps you're holding that position is because of the organization you represent. If you are not sitting in that organization, perhaps you'll have a contrary view. I'd like your response on that. No, my, my views are informed by a lot of uh, work I've done over over I have over 15 years experience interacting on these issues and getting to understand them so my view whether I'm working for the for the biodiversity and biosafety association of Kenya has been quite clear even in other institutions that I've worked for I've worked on the issues consistently for about 15 years now and uh, because I have a, I have had access to information and an understanding and interacting with both pro and those uh, scientists who have uh, taken a contrary opinion I'm able to make a decision and it's not just about working for Biba Kenya that I'm talking about this issue, it's about how do we ensure that Kenyans uh, maintain, uh, are able to access their biodiverse foods how do we ensure that uh, we, are st we stay safe, we feed on food on safe food, food safety remains paramount to avoid any challenges and uh, many have said that the generation that uh, makes the decision today as professor wangari madai said uh, said when she was alive is not the generation that will face the consequences if we are the generation that uh, will open the doors for gmos you will not see the effects in my generation because uh, there's a friend of mine who says, I can go to Huru Park, bring me GMO maize and I eat and you see if I'll fall. No, you will not fall immediately, but the effects you will see with the years. So the generation that will make a decision about this right now is, it, is not the generation that will face the consequences. So, okay. And it is important that we remain very precautious. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to be asking the two of you, um, uh, to weigh in on the options that Kenyans have now that it's very clear this is going to be here. I mean, uh, the trade CS was explicit about importing this anyway, said anyway, even without GMOs, people will still die. It was very explicit with this. But first, let me play the soundbite, our video of the week, because this was, uh, I think it was banned in 2012. Not I think it was banned in 2012, but uh, the current president was agriculture minister yes. up to around 2010, 2010 right? Yes. Up to around 2010. So it was banned after him. But let's listen to what he said then when he was agriculture minister, William Ruto. Until we are agreed as a country that we can have GMO, we will not have GMO. Until we develop our own local um, varieties using our own local expertise. Until that agreement, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is reached. So before I ask you uh, what options Kenyans have, do you believe we have that framework, um, local one? forget about the international like and says yes. you depend on research from outside uh -huh. to use it here do you believe we have that framework now first that we before, can apply? Before, before framework we have mm -hmm. local developed gm products okay and she also mentioned them she has mentioned cassava 
She has mentioned BT Maze. They are locally others. developed? Yes. Okay. And they are at different stages. One is under confined field trial, the other one is laboratory, the other one is national performance trial, the other one is awaiting to go to the farmers. Mm -hmm. Now, the framework we have in Kenya, following the Biosafety Act of 2009, there has since been four regulations. The labeling regulation was instituted in 2012. The handling regulation and environmental release regulation in 2011. And those are the things that uh, the, pre the current president, then Minister of Agriculture, was referring to. That until we have regulations in place that will really operationalize the act in a manner that is uh, controllable, traceable, and generally can be managed, we cannot go GM way. Okay. Now we do have. Okay. And the laws are there. Okay. And in fact, there's a time that uh, the Minister for Health, uh, His Excellency Mailu, had stopped our work, our field trials. And we wrote a letter to him saying, as far as we are concerned, the cabinet hold on GM is about importation. Why is our research being stopped? And we wrote an official letter, which is here. Mm -hmm. And he replied. He said, well, there's a ban in place. Uh, there was, a, of course, a misinterpretation. He said there was a ban in place, but we can talk, which means nothing. So we went to Parliament and petitioned. And Parliament allowed us to continue the trials. Okay. This is a, this is a petition. Okay. So mm -hmm. it is not something we are starting now when Ruta is now president. This is a work that has been ongoing, mm -hmm. but which was stopped at some point, at some point for okay. many years. Okay. And we petitioned Parliament. Mm -hmm and uh, we were allowed to continue okay. that's something that delayed the process okay yes. and, and your response on uh, availability of local and international framework that we can rely on as a country um to not only undertake the research but also to make food safe for consumption locally do we have it as yet yes we have the biosafety uh, law that was passed in 2009 and uh, revised in 2018 and the regulations on import export uh, labeling um, and uh, I think there are about four regulations uh, Dr. Terry has mentioned them yes with all this that we have uh, the challenge becomes uh, implementation as I mentioned earlier our national biosafety authority which is the regulator only has 50 staff who are to police in uh, the port of Mombasa, uh, JKIA, Isabania, uh, all these ports that we have uh, or po points of entry and also in the local market. And this becomes a major challenge because the capacity is very minimal in terms of ensuring that compliance is followed. Uh, but also, uh, even in terms of the uh, checking on like, for example, what I talked about risk assessment to ensure that uh, the applicants of uh, uh, the commercialization of the GMO products are adhering to the uh, risk assessment uh, procedures, issues of coexistence and uh, socioeconomic concerns. So I think we are a long way to go. We are Kenya is a signatory of the Cartagena Protocol, but also in terms of uh, uh, implementation on the ground, that becomes a challenge with only 50 staff to police the whole country. It's going to be a big challenge. Uh, to ensure that uh, there's no illegal importation, there's no uh, things that are done that are contrary to what has been agreed as per the Cartagena Protocol and our bus safety laws. All right. We have about seven minutes on the clock, and I can't go uh, without letting Kenyans know the um, options that are available for them. Because to me, 10 years on, we're still talking, you know. We're still talking research stopped. Uh, Kenyans still don't understand this very well. And uh, there's still so many concerns. So from where you sit, Daktari, what are the options available to Kenyans? And uh, uh, my director, Karen, just tells me, uh, half from where she said she really wants to understand if at all it comes here and it's co for consumption, not for animal feed, will we have the benefit of going to the shelves, for example, and it will be clearly labeled maize flour, GMO maize flour, organic. Do we have that? I know you talked about the labeling law and all that. So what are the options? Because it's apparent, uh, Moses Kuria says, Kenyans have to be fed. Today he was adamant that he cannot sit and wait and see Kenyans dying because of lack of food. Mm -hmm. So what now, are the options? Now, the first thing is that we have maize ready to go to the farm. Kefis is giving it a variety name and it goes to the farm. The ban, what we call ban, has been lifted. To me, I would say it has been regularized. 
not lifted but regularized. Now, that is one option. We adopt this and we have higher harvest or high yields. The issue of importation, and I think also um, we need to, I'm not, I don't belong to the government in terms of being a cabinet secretary, neither do I speak on their behalf. But as a Kenyan who went to school, I would want to distinguish between a joke and a serious matter. Even though some jokes are not meant for a serious matter like uh, uh, being sick. I would look at the context in which it has been used and don't become too moody about it. Uh, but I, I'm sure he has apologized, so that should end there. So what we share is this. The importation can be done a small consignment that is consistent with the deficit at the moment. Because Kenya consumes, I have the figures, we consume 4 million bags, metric tons, not bags really, bags are about three times, 4 million, and we produce 2.8. So we have a deficit. Yes, we have a deficit of 1.2 every year. So for now, it's an emergency issue. We can have limited importation, not flooding the market, because farmers have right as well. Limited importation to have a stop gap as we wait for the first harvest. That is uh, sensible to me. Okay. But of course, you must remember, we have hundreds of thousands of farmers, but we also have millions of consumers. And how to balance interests is the government's role. Okay. And they should use the best interests of the people. Okay. Yes. Uh, and your options for Kenyans, now that we have to feed a very hungry population? Yes. Uh uh, often uh, when we oh, let me start off with the with the joke that was made and uh, often when what someone says something like that uh, and says that uh, it's another way of uh, Kenyans another way for Kenyans to die it's very unfortunate and uh, but also a lot of questions are raised uh, about uh, why make such a comment are you also uh, agreeing that GMOs are another easier way of Kenyans to die but as uh, Dr. Ari has said, for us, uh, we are calling on the government to reinstate the ban on GMOs and do more local research. Uh, number two, uh, the importation, uh, first of all, buy from our farmers who are harvesting the maize. But even when we decide to go to import and increase our, our strategic grain reserve or maize reserve, let us go for non-GM. In previous years, we have always asked for non-GMO maize. It's available in the market. Why do you want to distort uh, the market? Because when you bring uh, maize, GMO maize that has been subsidized uh, from where it's coming from, it's going to be cheaper. What will our farmers do? with their maize and they produce it at a higher cost. Okay. The cost of fertilizer went up because of the conflict. And this is an issue that uh, we need to prioritize and be sovereign. We say Kenya is a sovereign state. Let us be seed sovereign and food sovereign. Thank you. Oh, okay, I still have two minutes. So I have to ask you in one minute because you are far away. Why do you, why do you think that we have to import from uh, jurisdictions that are far off from Kenya? I mean, East Africa community could have surplus that they could sell. We could maximize on them. We could change even the staple food. There. One of the reasons that Njeru Gidaye mentioned, we solely depend on maize is because we think maize is everything. We could change and do cassava stable or do rice uh, like the Nigerians do or something. Why do you think we depend? Is this business or it's, um, it, it's just something that comes up when people need to make money, which is still business? It's still, it's about business. It's about uh, bringing maize and uh, making uh, money. It's about corporate capture. As you say, if you go to Uganda, maize is not, a, it's not even, many Ugandans don't even eat maize. They prefer their, their matoke, matoke, cassava and sweet potatoes. Even Kenya, just uh, 20, 30 years ago, were not so dependent on maize. Mm -hmm. So government also needs to lead by uh, showing Kenyans and prioritizing other crops. Every time we talk about food insecurity, it's is maize. about maize. Mm -hmm. Yet we can diversify to the sorghums and the millets, which are more nutritious and superfoods. Thank you so much. Uh, why, why do you think we do that again? No, in a minute. Yes, okay. in a minute, yes. We have a but, minute exactly. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what I would say first is that GM is labeled, safe for use. Yeah. BT maize particularly is safe for use. Farmers are about to adopt it and we're waiting for bumper harvest. And in terms of uh, importation, the, we have done research and we have shown that GM is cheaper from countries that grow uh, 
that grow predominantly GM maize compared to conventional, what you call conventional maize, mm -hmm. is far cheaper. And business is about profits. So the millers that are in Kenya would want to buy the cheaper one to come and make more profit. Mm -hmm. Why would they go for more expensive one in Uganda, for example? It's business. And why is GM cheaper? Because the inputs are lower. Hello. The cost of planting. Yes, the cost of growing it and growing and low, is lower. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why we want our farmers to adopt it. Okay. Yes. Okay. And there's no other reason. I mean, you all live in Kenya. If we sink, we sink together. And if we sing. grow horns, <laughs> where will I go? We grow horns together. If we grow tails, <laughs> we grow <laughs> tails together. If we become huge, I wish I had time to talk about the other modified foods because now they're talking about chicken, for example, grown in uh, 30 days. It's enough to eat. I mean, it's unheard of. It's unheard of completely. I wish I had time, but tonight we had time only to talk about GMO maize. And this discussion is hot off our lips and obviously it continues. And I'd like to see you back again to have a discussion on this and have a discussion in a forum where Kenyans are. Uh, thank you so much, Anna Maina, National Coordinator, Biba Kenya. That's Biodiversity, Biosafety association of kenya thank you so much for speaking to us tonight looking forward to having further discussions on this because it's a matter of national interest and uh, dr joelo chieng uh, secretary general kenya university biotechnology consortium they are the people who will sink us <laughs> or, <laughs> or grow us thank you so much for coming on news hour tonight on behalf of the whole crew Meresha witi alia on sign language thank you so much for watching news our will uh, definitely i uh, and thank you so much for also joining us and have a good night god bless we have another opportunity for news hour next week on wednesday my name is ken mijungu on behalf of the whole team god bless